unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth, and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the Word. We're taking our reading today from the Gospel of St. John, the sixth chapter, from about the 25th verse. The Bible speaks of how the disciples, people, a multitude, was following after Jesus, they found him on the other side of the sea, and they said unto him, Rabbi, when comest thou thither? When did you come here? I believe they were looking for him. And then they asked, when did you come here? And the Bible says in the 26th verse, and Jesus answered to them and told them, verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. You did eat of the loaves and were filled. Jesus is telling them, I know that you are seeking me, but you are seeking me for the wrong reason. I fed you a while ago, and because I fed you a while ago, you're seeking probably to see the miracle provision of food again, which was okay. But you're not seeking me for the deeper things. You're not seeking me for the things that you really must seek me for. But anyway, you're seeking me for bread. Okay, of course there he's trying to give us an understanding of the reason of why we really seek him. You know, he says, they that seek me, find me. And perhaps you don't find him because you don't know how to seek or you don't have enough understanding and revelation in the seeking. And so these kind of people are there. And that is why in the next verse it says, labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. In other words, learn to seek or ask for the right things. Don't seek for meat that perishes. Don't seek God for things that are done with their own doing. But seek God for the things that are everlasting, that are tagged and pegged to eternal life and purpose. And this, the Son of God is trying to share a very big, big revelation. Big, big revelation there. Okay? And the next verse says, And then say they unto him, What shall we do that we might do the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that you believe on him whom he hath sent. And they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? What is the sign? But they've just seen Jesus feeding them. All right? Out of nothingness. But they're seeking for a bigger sign. Because he has claimed a higher responsibility toward humanity. And the Bible says now they bring out their sign of understanding. Their sign of worship. Verses uh, 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He is that bread of heaven that giveth life unto the world. And then said they unto him, even more, give us this bread. They said, hungry for that bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Shall never thirst. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thus. Let me give some background to this understanding. So they come to him because they're looking for another miracle of food and he's telling them, look, you are seeking for the wrong thing. You're asking for the wrong thing. Don't seek me for the things that perish. Don't seek me for the food that is done with its own doing. Seek me for things that are eternal. Seek me for meats that are tagged to eternal life. And of course, he gives them the guarantee that I'm something better. I'm bringing something better. I'm bringing a testimony that is bigger than all of you know. 
And of course, they go on and on saying, okay, yeah, we believe uh, what might we do that we might do the works of God. Then he tells them, believe on him that sent him. And for some random reason, they say, "Uh uh-huh, who are you? Show us a sign of who you are. What we have is the testimony of Moses. For our father fed us through Moses' leading in the wilderness with manna. That was a more notable sign to prove that there was something about believing in him. There was something about following after God. He sent a prophet called Moses, and this Moses, as he was leading us, we received food from heaven free without digging for it. That was a more notable sign. That was a more notable sign. And I want you to go back to why they're asking for something connected to that. Remember, they did not come to Jesus Christ for a deeper miracle. No, they came to Jesus Christ, like the Bible says, for meat. So because they have seen God manifest himself through the provisions of food, they believe if there has to be a space of believing him, he has to use that way. He has to come through that pattern. He has to come through that principle. That is the way they know how. That is the most notable The children of Israel for many years, you know, for a long time, were eating free food. So they're saying, look, yeah, you did a miracle of giving us food for one day. But God, through Moses, did way bigger than that. He fed our fathers for more than 40 years. So what sign do you show us that is bigger than what you are sharing us for the hour? What sign are you telling us that is bigger than eating for more than 40 days? Because their mindset is around food. And Jesus answers them and tells them, look, what Moses gave you compared to what I will give or I can give was nothing. It was not even food. He says, I am that bread of life. The thing that was on Moses or the thing that was in the wilderness, you could eat and feel hungry. He says, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me, the Bible says, he shall not thirst. So God is trying to reveal something so deep here. And here is the reality of Revelation. It's inevitable. It's important. It's of necessity that every believer discern the variations between the provisions of a specific season and those that sustain or nourish eternal purpose. I'm going to repeat it again. It's a very inevitable thing for every believer to discern the variations between the provisions of a specific season and those that nourish or sustain somebody for eternal purpose. What do I mean by that? Those two are different. When we are talking about God providing or divine providence, we have to be able to separate the provisions of God that are available for a season to fulfill a specific purpose in their doing, and the provisions of God that are connected or that sustain and nourish eternal purpose. Some provisions are seasonal. They're for their own season and they're for their own doing. And some provisions are connected to eternal purpose. They sustain and nourish your course on earth. And without them, you're short-circuited in the ministry of God concerning your life, regardless of whether you're the preacher or minister like I on a pulpit, or you minister in any other way at your workplace, at your job, or whatever, because all of that is done to the glory of God, and not all are called to preach on the pulpit like I. Hallelujah. And the wisdom to discern the difference is one of the greatest glories in the understanding of the ways of God. I have seen people who are seeking temporary seasonal provisions for the sustenance and nourishment of eternal purpose. And I have seen people who have attended to the provisions that nourish eternal purpose as though they were simply provisions of a specific season. And that happens in every aspect of our life. People, friends, There are people God has set in your life, for example, and they're just supposed to be in your life for a season. And after that season, they either will let you go or you will let them go or circumstances will separate the two of you. 
Good or bad? And I pray good. But there are people who are covenant friends. There are people, God knows that these will never leave your sight. Because according to the eternal plan concerning your life, they have a part and a space to fulfill in your life that is bigger than the conditions of the hour. And the wisdom to know the difference is the beginning of walking in the perfect will of God concerning your life. Why? Because you can stick on a relationship that was supposed to be seasonal and try to build it as though it is connected to eternal purpose. And with that, you're going to be destroyed. But likewise, there are people who have broken relationships that nourish or sustain a bigger part of their life course and destiny, and they have destroyed that relationship and assumed that that relationship was for a season because they think that the present circumstances either explain these two. No, it's not the present circumstances that explain these two. It's wisdom. It's the revelation of our destinies. When Naomi had lost her sons, and then she let her daughters-in-law go, Ruth had a choice. Ruth had a choice of going back to her own people. But the scripture said, she asked, she entreated Naomi that she might not leave her or depart from her. She told her, I will follow after you. Wherever you will go, I will go. Wherever you will lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. Your God shall be my God. If Ruth had gone back to her people as the culture had desired of that time, she would have been disconnected from a bigger eternal purpose. But by the wisdom of God and revelation of this mystery, something in Ruth tells us, stick on this woman, because there is something on your life that is connected to her life, and without her life, the fulfillment of your purpose on the earth will not manifest. It will not be seen. Again, I said, it takes revelation and wisdom to tell the difference. That does not only work in human relationships. It works even with our careers. Some people are in careers and they've gotten in a season where they have gotten to the end of the provisions that must follow that career. And after that, they no longer feel the grace that will spend them in that office. But maybe because of the income, maybe because of the other obligations of loans and debts and all these things, they find themselves stuck in jobs where they should have moved on long ago. So the provision and grace of that season was for that particular job. And the end of your purpose at that job has come, but you have stuck there because you see no way through. And because of that, some of you are out of God's will and purpose. Likewise, there are people who God has called with careers, with jobs, with callings that are tagged to eternal purpose in a way and are supposed to be sustaining for the rest of their lives. And they have plugged and disconnected because maybe just maybe these jobs these businesses these careers these callings are not comfortable anymore circumstances situations challenges troubles have come and these troubles have broken them and disconnected them and they feel ah, you know what eh? i think i'm going to quit this office i think i'm going to quit this ministry i think i'm going to quit this marriage i think i'm going to quit this i think i'm going to quit that it takes great wisdom to design the provisions of a specific season versus the provisions that sustain eternal purpose that are in for the long game, the long haul, the long play. But many believers don't know that. For example, the commitment of marriage is not a seasonal commitment. The commitment of marriage is stagged to eternal purpose. So we don't enter marriage as though we are entering a seasonal thing. I felt like getting married, and then I got married. I felt like having kids. Some people just feel like having kids, and they have kids when they feel like having them. Children don't come because you feel like having them. 
children come because they are supposed to be given by God with instruction. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. The Bible says before your child was formed in the womb, he knew that child. And he had a calling for that child. He had a destiny for that child. And because he had a calling for that child, it means there's a time frame that God has placed for that child to come. So you seek God and tell him, God, when, how? What are you telling us? Okay? So it's in every aspect. If you don't have that wisdom, many a time you'll walk out of the will of God and the purposes of that hour without even knowing it. And before you know it, certain things start working contrary to each other because the Bible says in Romans, all things work together for good for them that love him and are called according to his purposes. And you are tuned out of purpose. Your acoustics are bad in the spirit. Why? Because you are not in the right lane of the spirit. So it takes great wisdom and counsel to understand the difference. And so even in scripture, we see certain provisions that are seasonal. I will give you an example. When you look at the provision of manna, the one we're reading about, it was supposed to be a seasonal provision, not an eternal provision. It wasn't tagged to eternal course of provision. It was not supposed to be sustained for as long as humanity lived. No. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 5 verses 12, the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. The moment they enter Canaan and they start eating of the food of Canaan, the Bible says God ceased to give them manna. Neither had the children of Israel manna anymore, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. That means the provision of manna was available only in the time, in the period, in the frame of their move from Egypt to the promised land. In the wilderness, manna was a provision. But the moment they transitioned from the wilderness into the promised land, the provisions of manna were no longer sufficient nor necessary for that hour. But see how they enter the promised land and they start digging. They start tilling the ground like normal people do. And so somebody might think that there was a deeper glory in the wilderness because whatever I ate, I ate without the expense of my sweat. And now he have entered into the spaces of God's promise and I see effort. I see a straining of things. I see an exercising of life in this. Is this really the will of God? Because some people think that the perfect will of God it's supposed to be the space where there's no effort, there's no work, there's no, you know, commitment to a thing. That's a lazy Christianity, a laxity of spirit and a dullness of the soul. But some believers are like that. So when they start digging, they say, uh-uh, this is not where I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be where it's falling. But remember, the Bible says they call it manna because they knew not what it was. That means that they were in a constant provision in a season of a thing that was nourishing them, but they did not carry a revelation and understanding of what it was. Till now, it's called manna, meaning we did not know what it was. It carried an obscurity in identity because it was not the setting place of God's destiny for the children of Israel. They needed to transcend as a people into spaces of lands where they could identify and call and have a name and an identity of the provisions of God. But some were short-sighted in understanding that God was only preserving them in this period to take them to where the promise is. And once they enter that promise, they're supposed to rebuild a nation as it must. But they didn't have that understanding that God was trying to build a nation through them. Remember, even in the wilderness, they're missing the onions, the garlics, the leeks, and cucumber that they were eating in Egypt. They're saying, oh, we missed. So they would rather go back in bondage than eating something they know not as a provision for the hour and season of that time as God is transitioning them into the place of the promise. That is why the church should emphasize the doing of the process. Because many Christians are seeking and are asking for a product without respecting the process of that product. And as generations evolve, it's becoming even more complicated. The younger folk, they don't like working. They want to graduate tomorrow and then become you know, the executive director of an institution, but they don't understand the things that make the people that stand in those offices. And now we're in a hard-pressed circumstance in our dispensation to now tell our young people, learn to work hard. Learn to be dreamers. Learn to invent and innovate. Learn to do things that bring glory to God. Learn to understand that 
He will bless the works of your hands. He doesn't bless nothingness. You're not just going to sit in your home and then wealth comes. No, it doesn't happen that way. But that doesn't mean that because you've read in the Bible, oh, how, you know, Jacob was a tent dweller, so you wake up in the morning, you dwell in tents, watch TV, you know, sleep anytime you want, wake up anytime you want, and somehow money is going to come to you. Even pastors, preachers, even if you're a man of God, think of an alternative source of income. Because in this season, for example, where the churches are closed, for those of you that were, you know, relying on the baskets, how are you feeding? You know, how are you feeding? Oh, because that's what you call divine providence. No, that's not divine providence. That's another thing. You have another thing. And may the Lord help us to discern this. So we see that manna was only available in the time when they were in the wilderness, in the spaces of testation. They were not even supposed to stay in the wilderness for a long time. In fact, they did not go through the way of a Philistine, which was a shorter route. If they had gone that way, they would have gotten into the promised land about 12 or 14 days after. But it took them 40 years and 38 of those years around Mount Seir. You understand? But to God, he's only providing something they know not because he wants to lead them to a space where they ought to know. It's important to know what you're eating. It's important to understand what gets in you, whether spiritual or physical. Some people allow everything to get into their soul. Some people allow everything to enter into their spirit. Some people allow everything to enter into their body. They eat anything, everything, how they want it. You know, it's wisdom to know. Is wisdom to know. In First Kings chapter 17, verses uh, 14, there's a story there of a widow of uh, Zarephath. Some of us know the story of how through the prophet Elijah, God leads him to his particular widow. And uh, in the 14th verse, the Bible says, Elijah now is speaking to this woman. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meat shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. You know, if I can take us back to the story, famine had hit the earth by the command of Elijah, the prophet. Okay? And uh, during that time, people were lacking food. So he comes to this widow and tells her, give me your food. If you do, I promise you that you'll not lack again for this season until the rains come. And so this is the promise he gives her. That if you obey and give me a portion of your bread and oil. He tells her that the barrel of meat shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil faint until the day that the Lord shall send the rain upon the earth. And the 15th verse, she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meat wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord which he spake by Elijah. But remember, until the rains come. So the provision of that widow was to be sustained only for the season in the time when the whole earth was under a famine or drought or lack of food. She was supposed to have a continuous provision until the coming of the rain, when the rains are released. So we see that even though the Lord had released that as a provision, it was subject only until the rains return. When the rains return, she was not going to see any oil or any barrel of meat in her household until she goes back again tilling the ground to have provision. This is another case again in Scripture that is telling you that certain provisions are for a specific period of time. And when you outlive those periods of time or when the seasons of the world change, certain provisions cease. Okay? Some of us read the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. You know the story. And how this man sat on that pool, but not only him, John chapter 5, verses 2, all through verse 4. There were all manner of impotent folk, people who were blind, people who were withered, people who were sick. All manner of sickness was at that pool. And the story is given that uh, there was an angel that used to come down at a certain season into that pool and trouble the water. And whosoever falls in first, immediately that person was going to be healed. Now, we don't know whether that season was predictable or they just knew it was a season, but they could not, you know, time it. All we know is that there was a man who had spent 38 years at a pool waiting. So Jesus comes to this man, and he doesn't wait for the season, but he heals the man even out of the season when the angel was coming. So some people ask them the question, if that pool existed in Bethesda, when did it dry, or when did the angel stop coming to that pool? The Lord showed me that thing. 
the coming of Jesus Christ, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ changed a lot of things in the spirit realm. A lot of things in the spirit realm. Such provisions of healing like the pool of Bethesda and many other things history has given only were sustained for specific seasons and things like healing, the pool of Bethesda, you see that from the time Jesus is dead and raised from the dead, we don't hear any record of men going anywhere, a pool of that matter. In fact, I've taken time to read ancient manuscripts. I try to search out this thing and try to understand what happened to that particular pool. And history has it that from the death and resurrection of Jesus, that pool had to dry. Why? Because Jesus is trying to get the eyes of men from an angel that comes to stir the waters for their healing because that kind of healing is discriminated. You know, so whoever they're falling first, they're not going to heal. In fact, Jesus disproves that pattern of healing in his dispensation. Why? Because he finds a man before the angel falls in and then he gives healing to that man. He's trying to say that I'm not the God that is subject to the times and seasons of healing. I'm the God that is subject and attuned to faith. If you're able to believe for this, I will surely give you a miracle. Now back to the point I'm trying to give us. Like the pool of Bethesda, like the provisions of the widow Zarephath, like the provision of manna, which was seasonal. When Jesus comes, he's trying to bring something that is eternal. He's trying to bring an eternal provision. He's trying to bring a revelation around what it means to stay steadily supplied by the hand of God. And so he tells them, look, those people that lived in the days of Moses, your fathers, is now speaking to Israel. Yes, they did eat manna, but that was not from heaven. He's not saying that it wasn't God sent. But they only try to imply that its destiny was of a seasonal provision, not after the heart of God and the revelation of God's provision. Now Jesus comes to them and tells them, look, I am that provision. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, he that cometh to me shall not hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Underline the word, never thirst, never hunger. Jesus is trying to introduce to the church the power of fullness, the fullness of God. Remember, in him, the Bible says, dwelt all the fullness of God bodily. He was a hundred percent man, but he was also a hundred percent God. He's bringing something to us. He's trying to release a certain grace on the earth. Wherewith, if any man ever come to him, that man shall never, 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 never hunger. And if any man believeth on him, he says, that man shall never thirst. So yes, we are speaking about provision, not just financial, but any other aspect of provision. Whether you're talking about the supply of graces, anointings, glories, wisdoms, Peace, divine health, and all these other things. Jesus is trying to tell us that when you say that you're coming to me, I should not remind you of the seasonal provision of the widow of Zarephath. No, I'm supposed to remind you of an ever-ending flow of provision wherewith you shall never hunger nor thirst again. You shall never hunger no thirst again. In other words, you will never lack. Whatever you will need shall be available for you. If you ever need healing, it shall be available for you. If you ever need deliverance, it shall be available for you. If you ever need financial provision, it shall be available for you. If you're barren and you need a child, that child is available for you. If you're believing God for a spouse, that spouse is available for you. If you're believing God for provision in your ministry, that provision is available for you. You need to see it. And it's not available for you only for a season. 
One day, a fellow comes to me once and told me, you know, when we just started for now, years ago, he told me, you know, these things don't last for three years or more. They are usually one or two, at most three. So he told me, for your congregation where you're sitting, five, ten thousand and so, those are just provisionals that are just there for one to three years. By the third year, this thing will be gone. And then he warned me. So he tells me, now, in this first, second, third year, store up as much as you can. Invest as much as you can. Save up as much as you can. You know, utilize as much as you can. Maximize as much as you can. Because after these three years, it shall go down. And I listened to him. And out of respect, I did not say anything. And after parting from him, I remember I went home and I laughed. I laughed so hard. So hard. I could not stop laughing. And you asked me, why was I laughing? I pictured, because I have a very creative mind, I pictured the devil looking at me and I'm laughing at him because of such a stupid statement concerning the kingdom of God. And I started to talk to him. I said, devil, you're so, 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 so weak in your mind. How would you think that you could speak to me that way? How would you think that I would underrate and underestimate the power and provisions of God to make me believe that God's provision of the anointing, the glory, and whatever was moving in this dispensation for me was only for three years? Where was that written? Oh, maybe he was following Jesus' story. I don't know. But you see, if you read of the Bible, Jesus did not end his ministry at three years. Jesus' ministry has never ended. No. There's a part of his ministry in the flesh. But his ministry has never ended. It has always been there. Even before he was born in the flesh, the Bible says he was the rock, he was the cloud, he was the fire by night. But it only takes a revelation to understand that the Spirit of Christ has been in supply from the beginning of the ages until the end of the ages. He is the beginning and the end. is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the author and finisher. He has no spaces to die. There is no death within him. He is life and life only. So I laughed at the devil. And I said in the name of Jesus Christ that regardless of what has been said by that gentleman, devil, let me repeat it again before you. Touching the increase of his government, the things that are touching the peace of his government. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, there shall be no end. And he says, and upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, I'll order and I will establish it. So we are in a constant provision of God to order our steps according to his will and purposes, but also to establish us even as he orders our steps. So wherever your step goes, he establishes you. Wherever you put your next step, he establishes you. Every year we have seen not only the establishment and ordering of the Holy Spirit, but we have seen the increase and peace of this ministry. And guess what? Until Jesus returns, it shall be so and not otherwise. Why? Because the one that called us to this glory and virtue promised that we shall never hunger nor thirst for anything. When you awaken yourself to that kind of consciousness, you understand what it means to live in the overflow. Because when you enter the overflow of the Spirit, you pour out into the ministration of the Spirit even without effort. Because every way of your life is a pattern for them that should believe after. Is a pattern of them that should believe after. But again, not everybody will see it that way. Okay? Because Jesus Christ, when he walked the surface of his heart, some people called him <laughs> Beelzebub, prince of demons. Because they didn't have a name to call what was happening in that dispensation. But that still didn't change the fact that Jesus Christ's ministry continued on the earth and it has succeeded and achieved everything the Father has wanted to achieve through his person up to today. In the name of Jesus, we cast out devils. We cleanse lepers. We raise the dead. We heal the sick.
we do signs, miracles, and wonders. We see God every other day. Jesus has continued to be an answer through that name. His ministry is growing and growing every other day. And God has not just called us to a space where we're provided sufficiently. No. He wants us to get into the spaces of the overflow because he has guaranteed the constant provision of our peace, the constant provision of our finances, the constant provision of our health, the constant provision of everything we need for your business, for your ministry, for your family. You must carry this consciousness and that consciousness has to saturate your temple because it places you in the right places of the spirit for the influence that you must have in this dispensation. It aligns the favors that are supposed to be available for your time. It brings the people that you need to fulfill your vision. Remember the Bible says, kings shall come to your rising, Gentiles shall come to your light, strangers shall come and serve you. What are they serving? The vision of the overflow. The vision of the overflowing spirit. Because it carries the awakening every other day. And the constant assurance that every minute of its life is a provision to the world. It's a gift to the world. Some of you are living so much on the side of lack and consciousness to lack that you're not a gift. You are a burden. You are a burden. I tell believers that when you are awakened to this, you will never beg. You will never beg. You will never ask a man. No. Men will give you before you ask. And some people even lock the door of provision. Because God can invite a man to bless you without asking them. Alright? And when God invites them to bless you without asking them, now you're awakening to the consciousness of God's provision. Then you get to a space where you run out, and then you go to the same people who provided for you before the Lord led them, seeking for lightning to strike twice in the same place. And the first time, they come with honor to bless. The second time, you look pathetic to them because you don't understand that they only provide as the Lord leads them, not after your demands. Because somebody blessed you with some day mean that you're going to make them an ATM machine. They're not your God. And if they don't provide for you tomorrow, God will still open a way. He will still make a way for your provision. If your eyes open to understand how these things work. But if you stay thinking, ah, you know, without this person I can't be, without this person's provision I can't be, without his fees I can't be, without their rent I can't be, then you have shifted your faith from God to man. Maybe that provision from that person came seasonal. And then you took that seasonal provision for granted as to think that you'll manipulate your way again to that individual for provision because once that door opened to you, if God opens the door for you and that same door shuts, do not knock at that door until God opens it again himself. If he doesn't, maybe it was only for that season and there is another opening. And some of you, take your eyes off the next door that should open because you go knocking on doors God closed long ago. Jesus Christ has intended that you never hunger. So when we say, oh, we're hungry for God, what do we mean? When we say, oh, let's hunger for God, what do we mean? What do we really mean? We mean... Let's create space for more provision. We don't mean that we are hungry as those that lack or as those that seek for his provision for anything. For we know by scripture that he has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. And he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. If he did not hold back his son, will he not with his son give you all things? So we know that we are provided for. We know that we have all sufficiency. We know that healing is ours. So when someone says, I'm hungering for the knowledge of God, you're not hungering for a knowledge that is distant and away from you and that through your effort then you shall find. No. You are hungering as one who is saying, I am creating more space for what you've already availed in God because everything that pertains to life and godliness is present and available for you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So when you say we're thirsting, we're not thirsting as those who are thirsty. We're thirsting as those who already are supplied, but we are creating more space. We are enlarging our tents for the deeper infill and flow 
of God's power and working and wisdom and glory and anointing in our lives because God can only fill the spaces you provide for. That's hunger. That's hunger. Some people get satisfied so early. And they do that only because they're ignorant of what God can do. Hallelujah, glory to God. The Lord has spoken to me a couple of years ago. And this has been a theme of my prayer for quite some time. As my spirit has been compelled to these realities. That the overflow is here. And that the overflow is coming to men and women who have designed true hunger and thirst with the consciousness of how much has already been given and available. So they are enlarging and enlarging for what is already available for them until a point where they cannot stretch further. Then anything poured into them is respecting the order of that hunger and thirst. And because of that, then they enter the overflow. That miracles are going to start for many of us who understand this, becoming so effortless. So effortless. And I see some of you entering places of blind people and they're healed. You will have a story in this ministry of a person who took my post that a blind person and the person saw. That's a grace. That's a grace. It's something I have no words for. But I know it exists through the word of God. And God is inviting you to that consciousness. Because you believed on Jesus, he says, you shall never hunger, nor thirst again. It's not your story. It's not your story. I feel the presence of God. These things, by revelation tonight, have invited you into a space where for the rest of your life, you are going to look back from this day and see God did something so remarkable in your life. Today is a very defining day for many people right now that are listening. I can tell when a milestone is drawn and tonight a certain milestone, a certain key is opening something in the spirit for somebody's destiny. I just want you to open your mouth right now and speak to God. 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 Everything you're asking for is available. So thank Him with thanksgiving. With thanksgiving. Lift your voice to God. Thank him for life. Thank him for faith. Thank him for hope. Thank him for giving you everything that pertains to life. To life and godliness. Receive it as it's available. Receive it as it's available. Take it because it is yours for the taking. See your mind walk in places. See your spirit live in spaces. Then only those who don't hunger are or who will never thirst. Those that are in the overflow of the Spirit. God is providing something. He's making a way. He gives understanding. His glory on your life is going to be evident. Evident. More than it has ever been before. I feel healing is taking place. I feel restoration is taking place. I feel deliverance is taking place. I feel God is answering questions. I see the hand of God touching people, aligning them for their calling. I see the wisdom of God set on your life to know the things that are for the season and the things that sustain and nourish eternal purpose. I bless God because he's doing something in our lives that I have no words for. Receive it as it's available. 
Ria la makoza la brozo lo boko shi kete le brozo le pa. Rika ya la mando robo za la bako se brozo lo boko shi re kese le pa ta la ba. Rendo robo zi ke brozo ko shi kete le brozo lo pa. Karamando robo za la bako ze le brozo ko to lo pa. Hesi kete le hezi ke le mako lo bo. Yeri ke brozi le le ko de le ze le ke ne ke ze ke le te le. Ko sa prazalando lo bo zi ke shi te le pa. Carindo lo bozele prozolo bo koshi tele prozolo bo braze ke tele proko tele le meke shile hari ke tele prozolo poko raba zalana makoro broko soko tele pra zele ke shi tele prozolo bo koshi le pa rinde le koshi nda la hasile bo rinda la koshi ke prozolo bo si ke he hakote le prozolo poko shala pata la pa rika tala mandara kasa tele pro zile prozolo koshi ke tele mo hazi ke tele pa yaka. Ye ketele mroko zele ketele po. Rika talamanda riko satala pa yaraba. Zelika prazala pa kazeke po koshetele po. Rike tele ma yalaba. I lean in God. I lean in God. I connect into this, oh God. I connect in a space where I will never hunger nor thirst. To a place of the overflow. Where whatever comes through me pours out also to change the world. As it touches me, it touches the world. As it touches me, it touches my institution. As it touches me, it touches my marriage. As it touches me, it touches my relatives. As it touches me, it touches my friends. God enlarge us. Enlarge us. Enlarge us. Enlarge us. Enlarge us in your wisdom, in your revelation. In Jesus' mighty name we pray and believe. Amen. Hallelujah. If you have not received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're hungry for what you know not. And you're thirsting for what has no name. You carry no direction, regardless of whatever is working right in your life. But I feel that by God, God has opened a window right now for you and it doesn't need to be your most convenient hour he doesn't want you perfect yet he doesn't want you to first go back and quit drinking no 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 no. he wants you to just come as you are the bible says come as you are and i shall give you rest he did not want self-improvement on you to invite you to the kingdom he's saying whether right now you're, you're in the wrong place at the wrong time but you're listening to this sermon He's saying, allow me to take your hand right now and carry you through faith. And leave the rest of the details of fixing you to me as God. The Bible says there is no name under the earth or in heaven by which men are saved. Save the name of Jesus Christ. There is no name given. And that is the name inviting you tonight. That you might never hunger. That you might know what you eat and who you have received. So you repeat these words after me from your heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my personal Lord and Savior. I'm born again. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 041-466-4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org. Or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero. Make manifest. Thank you.